Hey guys, so today I want to go over some of the soundbars and speaker systems I've owned in the past both for my desktop setup and for my TV setup because I haven't really talked about this before in the past. So just going over my history with soundbars, um, I think my first soundbar was the Samsung HWE450. So this was a cheap $200 Samsung um, I bought actually as a, like kind of my introduction to soundbars. Um, it's a nice space saving soundbar, it looks pretty decent. Um, I mounted it on my wall and came with a wireless subwoofer attached um, and yeah I mean it had Bluetooth and everything so it was uh, the virtual surround thing as well so yeah it, it was pretty decent I guess for the price I mean it wasn't too expensive or anything obviously it wasn't the best sounding soundbar I've heard or the best sounding speaker I've heard but I mean it was decent for the price and I remember I hosted a lot of house parties back then at my San Francisco apartment and this soundbar was key to all of those house parties because you know everyone knows at a house party you got to have the music going and this soundbar really fulfilled its role in there so definitely uh, put it to good use so yeah I think I had that soundbar roughly from 2013 to 2015 so um, yeah I put that one to good use so used it a lot and then my next soundbar after that uh, came as basically an upgrade for that one, uh, which was the Klipsch R4B. So Klipsch is, uh, I think, an upgrade in sound quality over Samsung in general. So I decided to get the R4B. I think it cost about $400 at the time. It just came out actually in 2015 and I bought it in 2016. And I used it for only about a year because I actually replaced it with a 2.1 speaker system, which was the Klipsch Pro Media. Um, 2.1 system after that but I mean the R4B was was pretty good uh, it's a nice upgrade over my Samsung soundbar so it's a uh, again another 2.1 system uh, has just two front firing speakers and a wireless subwoofer so yeah your typical I would say entry-level soundbar package but it's just a little bit of an, a slight upgrade over the Samsung it's not like a huge upgrade it's a slight upgrade so sound a little bit better but it wasn't like you know a massive jump or anything I think that's why I ended up um, just switching to the Klipsch Pro Media 2.1 after that so yeah um, when I was in Korea back in 2015 uh, I did want to upgrade to a, a nicer sounding speaker system than my laptop speakers so I bought the creative T4W uh, wireless system so basically this is a 2.1 system and uh, it was I guess pretty decent I cost I think $300 US at the time which um, I remember in Korea it was actually more expensive and the guy that sold me this, uh, this setup kept telling me oh it's really really expensive right so anyways I, I really wanted it though because you know I was a huge fan of creative stuff I already had like the creative sound blaster war 2 um, Bluetooth speaker so that was uh, I was really satisfied with that and I've owned a lot of creative products before it as well I think I the sound blaster e5 um, USB DAC as well so I wanted to uh, keep sticking to creative stuff so I bought the t4w uh, 2.1 satellite subwoofer system basically it just has two small um, desktop speakers and a subwoofer and it has a central control unit which you can use to uh, up the volume you can uh, plug in an aux cable uh, from external source or you can use Bluetooth which is why it's called the T4 wireless so the speakers itself is actually not wireless it's connected uh, to each other in the subwoofer um, but the wireless actually just means it's, it's um, able to be uh, used with Bluetooth so this was my main uh, speaker system when I was living in Korea so 2015-2016 uh, mostly had this setup um, and yeah I don't I don't think I have any kind of video or any, anything showing the showing off the sound or anything but um, I do remember this sounding pretty okay I mean not great because you can see the size of the speakers is not that big um, subwoofer is pretty decently sized though uh, but the speakers itself not that big um, so yeah uh, it's it's just okay I think for the sound because yeah there's only so much you can do with those uh, types of really small speakers but obviously a huge upgrade over my laptop speakers and I upgraded that to the Klipsch Pro Media 2.1 speaker system in 2016 uh, when it came back to San Francisco and uh, this actually costs less than that creative T4W I think this costs only about $150 US um, so yeah I mean Klipsch stuff is usually on sale so I managed to get this one uh, fairly cheap but this one um, it's very very powerful I think it outputs up to 200 watts of peak power uh, that's a lot and it's a THX certified um, so yeah you know that it's basically um, a very good speaker system for the, the money actually and get very loud for the size so I actually really enjoyed using this so much though so, so that it ended up being my main TV speakers as well replacing my Klipsch 
R4B, like I mentioned. Um, but initially, this was my desktop speaker system. The reason why I replaced my Creative T4Ws actually is because when I brought back my Creative T4Ws, I, seen, I think I kind of ruined it because the uh, power requirements from Korea to the US were different. And um, I think I actually blew out the power by connecting the, uh, the plug, you know, like the voltage uh, converter. Apparently something happened uh, and it kind of blew out the speaker system, unfortunately, so I kind of ruined that. Um, so yeah, that's why I basically had to upgrade to uh, another speaker system. And yeah, this one actually turned out, I think actually it was better sounding than the Creative <laughs> and it was cheaper too. Um, and I think the reason for that might be because it's not a wireless system, like you can't really connect Bluetooth to it at all. So this really only connects with aux. So yeah, it's pretty old school. Um, you can't do wireless connections, no Bluetooth or anything, um, only an aux connection. But you know, uh, it worked well for the time. So it's still a very good speaker system for the price, very powerful, uh, gets very loud. And yeah, I mean, it was my desktop system at first and it ended up being uh, my uh, speaker system for my TV later on because uh, it actually ended up outperforming my Klipsch soundbar, surprisingly. So yeah, uh, very good speaker system, I think, for the price and for the time. It also came with a 6.5 inch side firing subwoofer. So yeah, uh, very good value, I think, for the time, 150 bucks. This was probably the best sounding speaker system I've heard at that time. So you gotta remember, like, the only speaker systems I've, I've owned at that point were sound bars, the Creative T4W, which is kind of like small satellite speakers, and uh, portable Bluetooth speakers, like the, uh, the Bose SoundLink Mini and the Creative Sound Blaster War 2. So yeah, at that point, the Klipsch Pro Media 2.1s were probably far and beyond anything I've heard at that time. And then the next soundbar after that was the Creative Sound Blaster X Katana. And this soundbar is the one I've had for the longest. I actually still have it. Um, but I bought it back in 2017 and uh, mostly used it um, not with my TV setup, but with my computer setup. So it was, it was just good for everything. Good for laptops, good for desktops. Um, I usually put it under my monitor. But yeah, I used it in San Francisco. Um, I used it in Vancouver uh, at my old Vancouver apartment. I used it uh, in my Burnaby apartment for a while as well before I switched to um, switched to my Klipsch. Um, I think it was my R41 PMs I switched to after that. Um, but yeah, this soundbar um, I, I really liked for a very long time. I mean, I bought it for $300, um, which was the, uh, the new price. And basically, like this soundbar sounded a lot bigger than its actual size. Like it's not the biggest soundbar. It's actually a very compact soundbar. Uh, so because it's actually meant to go under your um, your monitor. So it's not actually meant for a TV at all. Although you could use it with a TV. It was actually advertised as a gaming soundbar, like for your PC, kind of like the Razer Leviathan. So. Yeah, uh, when I got this, I basically just used it with my gaming computer, with my Alienware at the time, and uh, continued using it with my gaming computer, uh, the Sirepower PC later. So, yeah, what's great about the soundbar is, uh, first of all, it's, um, it has four drivers inside the soundbar itself. It's got uh, two tweeters inside the soundbar, and it's got two up-firing mid-bass drivers, which is really cool. Uh, I didn't see the up-firing ones before um, in a soundbar this size. And it's got a subwoofer too, but it's not wireless, it's actually connected to the soundbar. Um, but yeah, um, this is not too expensive, 300 bucks, and doesn't take up much space on my desk. You just put it on your desk and then for a very long time it satisfied me, right? When I was like playing games or whatever, the thing can actually get really loud. It's rated at 75 watts RMS, but I remember never turning this thing past 30 on the volume because it, it can get like really loud. <laughs> so I think I only max it out at like maybe 30 volume. It's just... This, this soundbar sounds so much bigger than its size would suggest. And it's, it's got so many features inside of it. I mean, it comes with a USB DAC, obviously, because you can connect it to your computer. Um, and it has virtual 7.1 surround mode. Um, again, just like most other soundbars, but this one is for your desktop setup. Um, has optical input, has Bluetooth input, uh, and of course the USB input as well, and an aux input. And yeah, it's, it's just got so many features, so many different inputs. I mean, even you could use it with your TV if you wanted to, since it has that optical input. Um, or you can just use that as a Bluetooth speaker, since it has Bluetooth. So yeah, just all in all, very, very versatile speaker. Um, I've done an unboxing of it. I did, like, I've, I've done demos of this speaker in action before. Uh, so yeah, it's obviously still not comparable to a dedicated, you know, bookshelf speaker setup. You know, that's why I moved to a bookshelf speaker setup after this. But, you know, for a very long time, this was uh, my main computer speaker and it really did satisfy me for like a good like 
three or four years maybe yeah so for three or four years I mean this this was just good enough for me I mean it sounded good um, it had a lot of features and uh, yeah it's just it looked pretty nice actually on my desktop because uh, they do model it they call it the katana because they model it after the Japanese sword so it looks pretty sleek actually and compact so yeah anyways this was my main soundbar uh, for a good four years I think upgrade from the Sound Blaster X Katana were actually um, a pair of powered speakers. So the Klipsch R41 PMs, these were the ones that um, I upgraded to from the, uh, the Sound Blaster Xs. And um, I think compared to the Creative Sound Blaster X, it's not quite as uh, powerful in terms of the pure power, but it does provide better stereo separation, of course, because it's two physically separate speakers. And I think it was overall, um, it was overall probably an upgrade except for the bass because uh, these are just 2.0 speakers. There's no subwoofer attached to it. I don't think I got a subwoofer with these speakers. So yeah, the subwoofer for the Creative Sound Blaster was still better. Of course, it had better bass response because of that. Um, but I think in terms of the highs and the mids, uh, I think the R41PM was probably an upgrade. Uh, even though it wasn't, like, in terms of pure power, it wasn't as powerful as the, the Creative Sound Blasters were. Um, but overall, I thought it was, a, it was a decent upgrade. So, yeah, the specs on this one, 1 inch aluminum LTS tweeters, 90 by 90 square traction horns, that's Eclipse signature technology that they always use on everything. Base reflex rear firing port, of course, four inch uh, IMG woofers. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's powered, so it has a built in amp. So at this time, I, I wasn't like going crazy buying these different amps and, uh, and bookshelf speakers at that time. This was probably the last set of speakers I had before I kind of went crazy and started buying all these <laughs> different bookshelf speakers and amps and stuff like that. But yeah, this one actually had a lot of features inside of it, and this only costed like $150, I think. So it really wasn't that expensive, but it did have a lot of features, and it looked really good, right? It looks really vintage and stuff, but also has integrated Fano preamp, so I don't need to buy a separate Fano preamp. I can just c connect my turntable to it. Um, you can use your, uh, your phone or whatever to stream Bluetooth to it, so it supports Bluetooth. And it has uh, analog RCA in, so if you have anything analog connection, you can also connect it, and it has USB input as well. So this thing has a lot of different features, and it's not that expensive. So I think that's why I went for this, and yeah, I found like overall, I think the sound quality was um, probably an upgrade in, uh, over the Sound Blaster in terms of actual like detail and clarity, um, but the bass and the pure power was still not as much as my Sound Blaster X Katana. So I think that's why I still ended up keeping my uh, Creative Sound Blaster X Katana. Um, and I think that's, it's still like a nice little compact sound bar, I guess, for, uh, for simple setups. So, but yeah, I think this ended up being my last pair of speakers before I kind of went crazy and started buying all these really expensive stuff, which you can see in my previous videos about comparing different bookshelf speakers. I kind of went crazy with that. <laughs>
So next up I have the Sony HT-ST5000. So this is a 7.1.2 channel Dolby Atmos DTS-X soundbar uh, that was um, that I actually had back uh, I think in 2018. So this was released maybe like five years ago. It was quite expensive. Um, still is quite expensive actually if you buy it direct from Sony, but it was uh, $1,500 US. So it's um, yeah, pretty expensive soundbar. But yeah, this thing was, it, it was massive. Like, <laughs> I think this might have been the biggest, uh, definitely the biggest soundbar I've ever owned. It's, it's just a massive soundbar and the subwoofer is also pretty massive as well. So yeah, just to go over it, um, basically, uh, just like all Sony products, it's very well made and it looks very industrial looking. I think uh, that's what Sony is going for with a lot of their products, but you can tell it has a very premium feel to it and it's very heavy and it's very large. Um, so what's special about the soundbar, other than the fact that it's pretty expensive, uh, that's actually pretty normal for a high-end Sony product though. Um, <laughs> yeah, Sony makes a lot of high-end audio products and they're definitely not cheap. But this soundbar uh, in particular, it's, it's very powerful. So first it has um, 7.1.2 channel, like I said, it's Dolby Atmos DTS-X, so it has two upfiring drivers in addition to seven speakers in the front. So yes, seven speakers in the front and then two up firing. Um, and then the point one, of course, is a subwoofer. So yeah, you got a total of uh, 10 speakers, right? <laughs> seven speakers, uh, front firing in the soundbar, then two up firing and then one uh, for the sub. So a total of 10 speakers as part of this package, which is, uh, that's a lot of speakers. Um, so this soundbar actually, while it's not exactly going to give you like the type of sound stage you'll get from a discrete setup, uh, it can come pretty close just because of how many speakers it, it packs in. Um, so it's quite a bit of speakers. Also the power output is 800 watts. Yes, 800 watts. So it tells you just how powerful this soundbar is. It might be one of the most powerful soundbars I've ever uh, seen. Like. <laughs> I really don't know, like there's a Creative X5 Sonic Carrier, I think, which is also really, really powerful. Some of the Nakamichi soundbars, I think, can be pretty powerful as well. But yeah, 800 watts of power, that's that's quite a bit. And because of that, I don't think I've ever needed to run this soundbar at full volume. It's just, it's loud enough for pretty much um, any space, whether it be like uh, you're living in a big room or a small apartment, it doesn't matter. Like, you'll never really be able to use the full limit of the soundbar because it's, it's just ridiculously powerful. So it has 7.1.2 S-Force Pro Front Surround Technology, which is a virtual surround sound technology um, that combines DSP uh, with wavefront technology to emulate a natural three-dimensional sound field. Um, so apparently, I guess this is supposed to um, make it sound like uh, a discrete setup, even though, you know, it's not, but it's trying to use like some kind of DSP trickery to fool you into thinking it's a virtual surround tech. So um, that's the thing. It's not like it doesn't have any rear speakers and it doesn't have any side speakers. So it's, it's not true surround, but it's trying to fool you into thinking that with a DSP technology. And of course the Dolby Atmos stuff is, is just like with all the other Dolby Atmos at home. So true Dolby Atmos is actually mounting speakers uh, on your ceiling. But since most people can't really do that um, or aren't willing to do that, um, basically Dolby Atmos enabled subwoofers or speakers, they just have an up firing speaker that bounces off the uh, ceiling basically to try to emulate or simulate the effect of a uh, of a ceiling speaker so that's what the uh, the two side up firing speakers are trying to do in this uh, 7.1.2 so yeah that's that's the, that's the case for a lot of these Dolby Atmos at home products is they really try to simulate um, the speaker coming down from the ceiling by bouncing it off the ceiling so yeah um, so it supports both Dolby Atmos and DTS-X um, and, and it has three HDCP 2.2 compatible HDMI inputs, one HDMI ARC output. It also has an optical input and an aux input and a USB connection. Uh, it uses this Sony proprietary technology, S-Master HX, digital sound enhancement engine DSEE HX. That's uh, Sony proprietary technologies to uh, reduce distortion. And um, DSE is basically similar to, I think, uh, Creative's X5 Crystallizer technology. It tries to, like, uh, what they say is trying to replace lost harmonics, restoring audio signal to, like, it's basically trying to upscale um, things to a high res 
Uh, I'm not sure like how well it works. Um, you know, you can't really replace something that was never there. So yeah, I don't, I'm not sure how DSEHX and, and the X5 Crystallizer works, but, but yeah, these technologies basically try to, uh, essentially trying to turn your lossy files into lossless files. I don't know how that works. Um, and then Clear Audio Plus, which is a kind of like a, a dialogue adjustment um, to make dialogues more clear, I guess, if you're watching movies. Um, and then it has a bunch of wireless codecs. Um, so in addition to 82P and AAC and SBC, it has LDAC, which is a Sony Bluetooth codec, which is a good thing because LDAC is pretty much the highest... Um, bitrate Bluetooth codec that you'll find on consumer products so it's and it's a Sony product so of course they should support LDAC but no support for the competitor which is Aptex. Um, it also has support for all the your standard DTS and Dolby Atmos formats so you and uh, Dolby formats so you have True HD support digital plus um, Dolby Digital, DTS HD, Master Audio, uh, DTS X has, has support for all of that um, also passes through HDR, so um, actually I don't know if it specifically supports Dolby Vision um, or HDR10+, Plus, but uh, definitely at least HDR10 it should support. And then it has a bunch of uh, streaming technologies built in because it has Chromecast built in, which is nice. Uh, you just tap the cast button and then you can use uh, Chromecast um, to stream your uh, things from your, you know, your phone or your, your laptop. And then Spotify Connect, uh, so if you have Spotify, you can uh, connect it to it, that's nice. Um, so yeah, um, this is a really, really powerful soundbar device, and I, I used it actually uh, in my Vancouver apartment. I lived in just like a, a one-room apartment at the time, and I remember I just, this thing was so massive, like it basically took up the entire desk and uh yeah like it was it was so overkill for my setup right i only had one desk and uh this thing just took up the entire length of the desk and um <laughs> but i was uh it was it was powerful and uh it was really good for watching movies i think i would use my panasonic ub820 blu-ray player ultra blu-ray player with it and uh yeah that was almost too loud i think that would actually wake up my roommates um, but then playing games through it, listening to music through it, obviously was was a delight. Um, as far as non-discrete setups go, as far as soundbar setups go, like you, this is probably one of the most powerful that you can get. So yeah, that's the Sony HTST 5000. I did a video on it before, but really didn't talk too much about it, so I wanted to go over it. Um, and I'm playing Blade Runner, so you can hear the sound coming out of it. Have the volume on about 22 right now, the subwoofer on 10. So hopefully you can hear the music from it. Okay, the next soundbar I want to talk about is uh, one that I got at the beginning of 2020 when I first moved into my Burnaby apartment and I just got my LG C9 OLED TV. Um, so I have a, a giant 55 inch 4K OLED TV and um, yeah, I actually, uh, the soundbar for the Sony soundbar was actually kind of too big <laughs> to actually fit I think on the uh, the actual TV stand that I bought for this so um, I decided to get another soundbar and this one is actually a little bit cheaper uh, but still fa fairly expensive I would say like uh, if you're talking about MSRP so this is the LG SL 10 YG uh, MSRP for this soundbar was $1,300 US so it's quite a, still quite an expensive soundbar but I didn't pay full price for this just like with the Sony I think I only paid um, 
$1,000 for the Sony, which is still expensive, but it's better than the $1,500 MSRP. For this soundbar, I paid uh, $500 US, so roughly less than half the price actually that it was uh, retailing for. So I actually got this uh, at quite a deal. Um, so that's that's another reason I got it. And another reason is because, well, it's LG, right? So it pairs well with my LG TV. So LG soundbar with LG TV pairs better, right? Makes sense. So. Yeah, let's talk a bit about this soundbar. Um, so unlike the Sony's, it's not as powerful or as big as the Sony's. Um, still fairly big, but it's not as big as the Sony's. It's a 5.1.2 instead of a 7.1.2, like the Sony's are. Um, so yeah, this one only has a total of uh, five speakers on the front, and it has two up-firing speakers, again, because of the Dolby Atmos. And again, it's trying to duplicate the effect of um, having speakers on your ceiling by uh, firing upwards at the ceiling and bouncing it off to kind of recreate that uh, ceiling effect. Um, and then it's trying to use the virtual surround technology just like the Sony. I mean, basically all the high-end soundbars do this nowadays. Or not even high-end, just like all soundbars. They try to have this virtual surround technology to try to make it feel like you have virtual surround speakers in the back and sides and stuff. Um, so yeah, this is like not obviously not going to replace an actual discrete like setup where you have surround speakers on the side and back but it is trying to give that effect virtually with DSP technology so it, it is trying to make you feel like it although it's obviously not quite as convincing as having actual speakers there however LG actually sells a uh, separate wireless surround sound kit that includes two surround speakers for the rear and I actually bought these as well. Um, so these, I paid about $120 US for them, but basically uh, they just, yeah, they connect wirelessly with the soundbar. So um, basically you plug in like this, uh, this external, um, I'm not sure what, sure what to call it, some kind of processor, I guess. You connect that and then you hook that up to the rear speaker kit and then it'll connect wirelessly to the soundbar. And these surround speakers are fine. I mean, they're not great or anything, um, but they'll give you like definitely better uh, presence, right, than the virtual surround for sure, because they're actually physical speakers. Um, they're 70 watts each, I believe, um, and they're, they're fairly small uh, and light. So they're not going to be like really powerful or anything like that, but just they're just weird speakers. So you don't really need to be them to be like really powerful anyways so they're just there to add like ambient effects and stuff like that and for for that I mean they're fine um, yeah I'm not as good as my current surround speakers which are my Martin Logan two eyes but I mean for 120 bucks for both of these and yeah, I mean yeah connected to a soundbar fine you know like it's it's still better than most soundbars with the virtual surround so having the the LG SPK8s I think that's the what they're called SPK8s wireless surround sound kit I recommend getting this if you're getting the soundbar so it will actually add some physical like rear surround presence to your music and uh, in movies so definitely I do recommend it it's not that expensive and it'll definitely add um, a sense of spaciousness right to your sound and, uh, and it's decent right for what it is so yeah um <clears throat> going back to the soundbar again the lg soundbar this one uses meridian technology because um, lg actually partners with um, meridian audio for several of their audio products so a bit about meridian audio meridian audio is a british company uh that's well known for making very high-end like high-end like audio equipment so they make very high-end speakers they make very high-end streaming um, devices to make very high end like network network players amplifiers things like that they're also like well known for um, for their technologies so they're known for meridian lossless packing which is a lossless compression technique for PCM audio and more recently probably they're well known for developing the uh, MQA standards so MQA is uh, a technology that stands for master quality quality authenticated uh, which is basically a lossy audio compression format, but it unfolds into like a lossless um, audio equivalent, I guess. So it's it's an interesting technology. Um, so these days, I think uh, a lot of high-end audio equipment, um, so the streamers and DAPs are going to support MQA. Uh, so it's still kind of a new technology, but you know you have more and more high-end audio equipment now supporting it. 
but essentially it is like a lossy compression format but apparently it tries to like unfold I guess into uh, into a lossless compression format so it's basically like trying to be like a FLAC or a WAV file or um, I'm not sure if it goes up to DSD level but it is trying to be a, like a lossless thing but it's trying to take up less space than a loss, typical lossless files because usually lossless files like FLACs take up a lot of space. MQA is really trying to have uh, it's trying to keep the same quality sound quality as lossless but it's um, trying to also get the small space the portable uh, amount of space as an mp3 right because mp3s don't take up a lot of space flax do but flax sound better right mqa is really trying to sound as good as flax but take up the same amount of space as mp3 so anyways that's what meridian audio is known for they're uh, actually a storied British uh, audio brand with a uh, lot of technology and expertise behind them. So I guess that's why LG decided to work with them. And apparently what Meridian uh, does is they combine, um, or they actually help out LG with their digital signal processing. And I guess that's what Meridian is, is good at, right? Is that, that kind of um, integration between um, the software algorithms and the hardware. So anyways, um, I, I haven't owned an LG soundbar in the past without Meridian, so I don't know like like how much better the Meridian technology makes the soundbar, but it's cool that uh, they co-branded with Meridian anyways. It gives them a little bit more leverage competing against, you know, Samsung and Sony with, and I guess all the other soundbar makers, which is pretty much uh, most consumer audio companies these days, right? Like Klipsch, um, uh, Definitive Tech, Sonos, you know, Pioneer, Yamaha. Uh, a lot of companies make soundbars these days. Polka Audio, you know, like so many different companies. So yeah, anyways, the, the Meridian Audio like basically gives them a little bit more prestige and uh, leverage to compete with uh, all these other soundbar manufacturers. And yeah, this is a Dolby Atmos soundbar, also supports DTS-X, uh, has Google Assistant built in, which is nice. Um, I always like to have, if you have like your Google Home Hub and everything, your Nest Hub, then uh, this soundbar will integrate right with that, which is nice. Um, 4K pass-through, um, so that's that's pretty standard. And yeah, let's uh, just keep going over the specs here. Yeah, this is Bluetooth streaming. Um, doesn't actually say which codex it supports. I'm guessing it's a standard AAC SPS codex. Um, but it doesn't say anything about LDAC, probably not LDAC. Uh, a, in Aptex, I don't think it says anything about Aptex, so probably not that either. So just your standard Bluetooth streaming, I'm guessing, with AAC and SBS. And uh, has Chromecast built in, so that's nice USB playback. Um, can also act as a hi-fi DAC, apparently has 24-bit upsampling. Uh, and yeah, like integrates with uh, all your your Google devices because it has Google Assistant built in. 570 watts of total power is what it has, it's just huge. Like that's a massive amount of power. I don't think I've ever, I'm, I don't think I'm ever gonna use the full amount of power because yeah, this soundbar goes really loud. Like I remember using it and it, it just goes really, really loud. Like this is a, a pretty powerful soundbar as well. Not as powerful as the Sony's I don't think. I mean the Sony's does have seven speakers in the front. This only has five, but still very very powerful soundbar um so yeah uh the subwoofer is 220 watts fairly big subwoofer as well uh again not as big as the sony's but still pretty big subwoofer um and yeah you have two front surround speakers 50 watts each and then you have a center 50 watt speaker and then you have two 50 watt side speakers which they call surround speakers and then you have two other 50 watt speakers that's up firing so that's for the atmos um, and then they have some other technologies like bass blast, uh, I guess increases the bass, um, some movie mode which increases the dialogue, and it supports all your regular Dol Dolby and, app and DTS formats, just like the Sony, so Dolby True HD, Dolby Digital, DTS HD Master Audio, uh, DTS X, Dolby Digital Plus, DTS Digital Surround, um, Atmos obviously, so yeah, it supports uh, LCPM, you know, supports all of those formats as you would expect. And um, yeah, Bluetooth 5.0, and it has two HDMI inputs, which was one of the things I don't like about the subwoofer. One of the reasons why I switched to uh, a dedicated, like, discrete 5.1 setup with my Marantz receiver, one of the reasons why I decided to do that is because 
just the LG soundbar only has two HDMI inputs and just soundbars in general don't have many inputs like the Sony only has three the LG only has two um, and I want to connect like you know at least five different devices so yeah uh, and unless you get like an HDMI switch here which I don't like to get uh, it's, it's just the soundbar just doesn't have uh, enough inputs um, so that's one of the issues with soundbars I find uh, so yeah the soundbar is pretty good it sounds pretty good pretty nice and so does the Sony the Sony and the LG soundbars these two soundbars have sounded probably like for me like soundbars you know obviously still lag behind discrete setups for 5.1 7.1 setups but these two soundbars sound pretty good in my opinion um, still pretty good so especially and they're really powerful like yeah, uh, the, the only problem for this is I think the main reason that prompted me to upgrade is uh, not only to get the discrete surround setup um, to get, you know, better uh, spaciousness and better, like, um, soundstage, um, but, and, and better sound quality, I guess, as well, because you can, you know, use dedicated speakers and stuff like that, but also because I want to use a receiver, uh, then I can plug in more of my devices. Cause yeah, I have at least five devices I need to plug in at any time. And uh, this LG soundbar only has two inputs. That's really the thing I don't like about it. Even the Sony had three, right? This LG one only had two. Uh, it also has an optical input and it has uh, HDMI 2, HDCP 2.2 out. Um, so, you know, that's pretty much what you expect these days. And yeah. Um, that's uh that's it pretty much it about the soundbar i think overall the sony's are more powerful and sound quality wise i think the sony's may have been a little bit better uh but the lg is still pretty good uh yeah so the lg and the meridian technology or whatever they use still pretty good and um I think the main reason why I got rid of it is just mainly I I want to have a receiver where I can put a whole bunch of my inputs in and plus you know I want to get like a like a discrete setup where I can actually feel you know the uh, the impact of different speakers like from different positions right uh, that's not something you can really do with the soundbar soundbar is always going to be the speaker is always going to be the same position it's not going to be that far apart uh, just the nature of a soundbar uh, even though the soundbar is pretty these two soundbars are pretty wide soundbars but even still right you you don't get as much of a sound stage or imaging is not as good as with a discrete setup so um, yeah but you know that said uh, the SL10YG and the Sony HTST 5000 are still both really good soundbars. Um, really expensive but hey you can actually find them online fairly uh, cheap now is these are actually fairly old so yeah the lg is at least like three years old and the sony is like five years old now so they're fairly old now so you can get them yeah probably much cheaper online but i also highly recommend if you buy the soundbar get the spk8 um wireless surround rear speaker kit uh, that will actually add some nice you know actual discrete type of technology to the mix and to the setup so it's not like a fully discrete setup, it'll, it'll add definitely more presence and you, you know, you'll actually feel the, the sound coming from behind you. Uh, whereas the virtual surround technology just isn't, still is not that convincing to me, you know. Uh, so, so, I mean, it is, there's only so much that DSP can do. Um, so it's not going to actually uh, duplicate the effect of an actual physical speakers coming from behind you. So if you do decide to get the SL10YG, I highly recommend getting the SPK8 rear surround sound kit uh, to pair with it as well. So uh, that's it. Um, that's the, uh, the LG SL10YG soundbar 5.1.2 channel. Um, Meridian Technology, uh, Adobe Atmos DTSX for both of these. Um, yeah, uh, I think these are both nice soundbars if you can find them at a reduced price. And I know the advantage of soundbars too is uh, they can save space um, and people just don't like to set up receivers and discrete setups. I know there's cables everywhere and yeah, people just don't want to deal with that hassle. So I understand there is a, um, there is a, a market for soundbars, right? And these are two of the best. So yeah. All right, this is Jedi Fallen Order. I have everything turned up to high, but not ultra right now to keep the frame rates a little bit smoother, but everything else is turned up. I have all the other settings turned on. 
and it's at 4K HDR. That's all we turned on. Watch out, BD. We did good work on the gun now. The more information we gather on Cordova and Zephyr, the closer we'll get to stopping the Empire. Hang on.
yeah guys, that's it. That's the history of all my uh, different desktop and home theater speaker systems I've used before in the past. Um, all the 2.1 and sound bars I've used. And yeah, the one after the LG sound bar that I upgraded to is the Martin Logan Motion 5.1 home theater system. It comes with four Martin Logan 2i bookshelf speakers, two for the fronts and two for the rear surrounds, as well as the Martin Logan uh, Motion 6i center channel and in a Martin Logan Dynamo 400 subwoofer. And I'm still using that speaker system today with a few changes. I've upgraded from the Motion 6i to the Motion 8i center channel and I've upgraded the two fronts from 2i's to Martin Logan 15i's instead. But otherwise, it's um, pretty much the same system and I use the Marantz receiver that I did a review on as well. So that's pretty much my home theater system uh, to this day. So yeah, uh, that's it guys. Let me know if you guys have any questions or comments about the history of my speaker setups. And uh, yeah, as always, stay tuned for more of my different sound system reviews and videos. And uh, if you like this stuff, please subscribe. And as always, thanks for watching. All right, so obviously, the surround sound is really good in this movie. And, and uh, I can definitely hear it very well, very well from the speaker setup. So I'm gonna stick you around you guys can hear it better. So, nice round. Front speaker. Center channel. Right, nice speaker. Left surround. So now hopefully you guys can hear some of the surround music as well. around Dolby Digital Live but this game natively supports 5.1 anyways so it's pretty nice all right actually I believe I played this part in my living room PC demo as well but we can now hear it using my new setup Let's hope not. Just got our comms working. Hmm. I'll try the same workaround to crack into theirs. So yeah, definitely hear all the ambient sound effects and everything from the surrounds, so that's really nice. Oh shoot. How about this guy? The ambush is me. Give me night of a lightsaber when I'm wall riding, that's cool. never get over the fact that this guy looks like Tom Holland from Spider-Man, but <laughs> it's like he was he was born to play the Star Wars role too. Okay, I'm done. You wanna fight me? 
Oh, you want to fight me? Pressure on him! Hit the Jedi! Okay. Oh. 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 Moving out. And of course, whenever I shift my perspective, the sound also changes in that direction as well. So that's pretty cool. I mean, it sounds like it makes sense um, in that, you know, it should be, uh, shouldn't be that surprising. But for me, I've played games mostly in stereo, you know, on a computer monitor. So um, having to play on a home theater system with a TV like this and everything is just a really nice experience. Like, I'm just used to playing games most of my life on a, you know, just a regular computer monitor and then using laptop speakers or something like that, right? I've been playing a lot of computer games using my laptop mostly for most of my life, actually. So, experiencing it on, uh, yeah, 55-inch OLED HDR TV with a nice 5.1 surround sound system, this is really nice. So. Come here, BD1. Great gaming experience. It's very theatrical, especially for a game like this, right? A game like this is already pretty, um cinematic but having all the equipment in place just makes it even more so and it makes it more immersive and uh, enjoyable so yep that's definitely it